So we are going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Aloni. I'm with Schneps Media. Schneps Media is the largest local media company in the New York metro area. We publish over 70 newspapers, magazines, websites, webinars, podcasts, and events throughout Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Westchester, Long Island, and Philadelphia. Today, we are thrilled to be able to bring you the webinar, Cardiac Care at New York City Health and Hospitals, Coney Island. You know, cardiac care is critical for everyone and time is of the essence. Today, we're talking with experts from Coney Island Hospital about preventative and emergency cardiac care. I'd like to welcome Dr. Mark Kinshu. Since 2016, Dr. Kinshu has served as chairman of emergency medicine at New York City Health and Hospitals, Coney Island. In this role, Dr. Kinshu is responsible for the operational activities of the hospital's emergency department. During his tenure, Dr. Kinshu has managed four year emergency medical residency training programs, which includes the hospital's first emergency medicine based fellowship in addiction medicine. Prior to his appointment at Coney Island Hospital, Dr. Kinshu served as chairman of emergency medicine at New York Presbyterian Queens, chief of service in emergency medicine at Mount Sinai Queens Hospital, and associate chairman of emergency medicine at New York Hospital Queens. With nearly 30 years of experience in emergency medicine, Dr. Kinshu received his medical degree from the University of Texas Medical School at Houston and completed a fellowship in emergency medical services from New York City Emergency Medical Services. He holds an MBA in management from the New York NYU Stern Graduate School of Business. Welcome, Dr. Kinshu. Thank you. Next, please welcome Dr. Sudanva Hede. Dr. Hede serves as Chief of Cardiology at New York City Health and Hospitals, Coney Island. Dr. Hede is an experienced healthcare leader specializing, specializing interventional cardiology. With nearly two decades of experience, Dr. Hede joined Coney Island Hospital this year and is leading its cardiac catheterization lab and in both inpatient and outpatient cardiology services. Dr. Hede has worked within the New York City Health and Hospital System for many years in numerous roles. Previously, he served as director of the Cardiac Catheterization Lab at New York City Health and Hospitals, Kings County, where he implemented protocols and established the hospital's invasive cardiac service. Additionally, he served as interventional semi-attending at University Hospital Brooklyn and interventional attending at New York City Health and Hospitals Bellevue. Dr. Hede completed both an interventional cardiology and cardiovascular fellowship at SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. He holds a master's in public health degree from the Harvard School of Public Health and attended medical school at Kasturba Medical College in Mangalore, India. Welcome, Dr. Hede. Thank you, Elizabeth. We have such esteem. I'm really honored to have you both with us. We're very lucky today. So Dr. Hedy, let me get started with you. We all worry about cardiac care and want to protect ourselves from suffering from a heart attack. What can one do to prevent a heart attack? Great question, Elizabeth, and welcome to participants on the webinar. Um, I think it's a concern that's shared by all of us in this current environment where we've just gone through a pandemic, we worry about our health. And I think it's a great time uh, to invest in ourselves uh, for all of us uh, and to figure out how can we prevent different events that can happen in our life. And the two big catastrophic events uh, in terms of a vascular disease is heart attack and stroke. Um, we have a lot of information about what the risk profile is. Uh, we have retrospective data that has looked into it and we know what causes what puts us at higher risk for these events. And these are having hypertension, having diabetes, having hypercholesterol, smoking. These are events that consistently show up as predictors of future events. Mm -hmm. What we've done well in the last five to seven years is two things. One, we are now able to have a calculator that better stratifies the risk and while we've had these calculators in the past, what's different about it now is that they are applicable to a wider population and wider ethnicity group uh, in the US population. So we can now have a better estimate of uh, what these risk factors are uh, and hence work towards preventing it, or I would say lowering your risk more than 
anything else to see uh, to lower your risk of these events. Now, what are these events? These are uh, what are these risk factors? These are hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, and elevated LDL cholesterol or a low HDL cholesterol, which we call as the good cholesterol, um, knowing whether you have diabetes or not. And you know, if you're a smoker, then certainly quitting smoking can reduce your risk. But to start off to prevent these events, you certainly need to know about these risks. Um, you know, blood pressure, diabetes, hypercholesterol doesn't trouble you till you have an event. So it's important and incumbent upon yourself to go and have a check to see whether you have these risk factors. I would say I would invest a little bit of time, look around the neighborhood, see if there is a PCP, primary care provider, or a family practitioner, and have a set up with them to at least have a clinic visit and have a risk assessment of yourself. And it's simple to do because they can check your blood pressure, they can run a blood test and see whether you have a cholesterol problem or a diabetes problem. And once you have this information, you're armed with this information, you can then have a meaningful discussion with your primary care provider as what the next steps can be and what you should do. Um, the wonderful thing about the internet is if you have this information already, you can already put these information into a risk calculator uh, called the ASCVD or Ocular Sclerotic Cardiovascular uh, Disease Risk Calculator. And it can give you an estimate of what your 10-year risk is. Now, the risk is grouped into low risk, intermediate risk, elevated risk, and high risk. So based on where you are on that risk, you can get an estimate of what your risk is, and then you can take actions um, required to lower that risk. You can certainly have a meaningful discussion with your primary care provider if you're at the lower end of the risk as to what you could do to keep that risk low and what lifestyle changes can you make as you grow older. You know, one of the risk, uh, risk factors in the calculator is age, and none of us can do much about it other than grow old gracefully. So what can you change? What are the risk components that you can change and how can you lead a healthy lifestyle? That's the key question to all of us. Uh, and we all need help with that. And I think understanding and having an estimate of risk goes a long way in helping reducing that risk. So access your healthcare. Uh, you could have a televisit. You could have the blood test done. And once you have the risk, you are on the path to figuring out what would be the best strategy for you. I, say, I would say invest a little bit of time in seeing a healthcare physician uh, and start your journey there. I think that's fantastic advice. In fact, I shared that risk estimator, the, the link, I shared it in the chat with everyone. So it's really as easy as just clicking it. Um, you know, we love that you're here, attendees, and, and, and learning this. And I think the point is just take a moment, you know, check out your, your risk level and just start asking questions and seeing where you can make changes in your life. I think that's, you know, tremendous advice, whether you're a low risk or high risk. Thank you for that advice. So, you mentioned some different things that make people susceptible to heart attacks. You know, how much does a family history have in, have in that mix? Is that something you should be discussing with your doctors as well? It, it's yes, it, it, the family risk is, it does put you at risk for events. Now, if you look at the calculator, the family risk is not really a part of the risk calculator. So these are what we call as risk enhancers. Now, calculators of risk have their own limitations in the sense that um, there are certain risks that fall outside of these previews and they're not included in the risk calculator, but there are other risk factors, what we call as risk enhancers that if you are at a lower risk, then you can then look at a second set of criteria and say, you have these risk enhancers. Maybe you should be on certain medication to lower your risk, even though your risk is on the 
low or the low intermediate group. So we not only have the known risk, but we now have the risk enhancers uh, where we can up your risk and say, maybe you should be uh, taking a cholesterol medication. Uh, these are important discussions to have with your primary care provider. And this is why uh, it is important to establish uh, care with the PCP or a family practitioner who can help guide you through this maze uh, of understanding these risks. Maybe you don't want to take medication, in which case, what lifestyle modification changes can you make? Again, it's an important step in starting a discussion about your health. Uh, and I think uh, it will go a long way in understanding the risk and what actions you can take and having a meaningful discussions with uh, providers uh, to know what to do. Now, there's a ton of information on, available on the web. And sometimes a lot of information needs to be synthesized uh, to know where to go with this. So an important step, um, establish care, know your risk, uh, figure out what to do next. What are some of those enhanced risk factors? So some of the enhanced risk factors are a family history of um, coronary artery disease. Uh, some patients have what we call as inflammation, uh, inflammatory disease, those people are are considered a little higher risk. They don't show up on your risk calculator, but they are considered a little higher risk. If you have kidney problem, you're considered to have a little higher risk of having cardiovascular events. So there are a few other uh, components that are, in, that are not included in the risk calculator, but are part of the risk profile that bump up your risk. So if you're truly at low risk and you have the risk analysis, then again, you can have a discussion with the primary care provider and say, what should I be doing? Should I take a medication to lower my risk? Is it worth the uh, risk of taking a medication? All of these are discussions to be had. Uh, and I think uh, it will be valuable and helpful for you to know where your risk is and what to do next about it. Fantastic. So knowledge really is power, you know, and not just Dr. Google, but, you know, getting your risk in hand, getting your risk factors, going to your doctor, discussing them, discussing your current health situation and your and your family history and finding out what those risks are and making changes in your life to be able to prevent a heart attack from happening. Very true. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about the Coney Island Hospital's PCI Center and why it's important for a hospital to have a PCI Center. Great question. So the limitation of all of the preventive efforts that we have is we don't fully understand who gets a heart attack, what triggers the heart attack. Um, not what we've seen is not everyone with the risk factor have the heart attack and not there are people who don't have the risk factors and have the heart attack. So prevention goes a long way, but there are still people who get these events. And that's part of research that has been going on for a long period of time. There are inflammatory markers that, been, that have been looked at. However, all of these things have not made it into the guidelines. Some have made it like CRP, uh, as an inflammatory marker have made it to uh, the secondary guidelines to show that if you have an elevated marker, then reducing your risk can be helpful. Uh, but there are patients who don't fit into the risk profile and have events. So it is in those patients that you need to have the treatment option. And what we have now is a 24-7, 365 days, um, round the clock, team that is available to take care of people who have a heart attack. And the ED is equipped to receive this. The team is equipped to come at any hour of the day or night to come and take care of these patients. So the goal is early recognition, early treatment, and early treatment means a lot of muscle safe. So you want your heart, when you have a heart attack, to have early access, quick access, early recognition, and save the muscle. And this can have long-term benefits, uh, even if you have a heart attack, by having 
quick access to care uh, and opening up the vessel saves muscle. So we say time is muscle. So in those cases, uh, not only does it save life, but it improves the heart as a function, uh, which on the long term can uh, prevent muscle injury. Very important. And what is, I'm just going to ask a, a, a naive question, but what does PCI stand for? PCI stands for percutaneous intervention. Ah. So we, what we do is we introduce a catheter through an artery. Uh, nowadays, we do an artery through the artery in the hand uh, called the radial artery. And we go up into the heart and we figure out uh, is there a blockage? And if there is a blockage, we are able to open up the blockage uh, you know, by either su suctioning the clot, uh, opening the vessel, and having the vessel open. And that's the key to uh, having good outcomes in the long run. Because if you have significant muscle damage, um, you will have symptoms like heart failure. So we want to not only save life, but we also want to prevent the long term consequence of these events so that you can have a better quality of life. So a PCI center refers to um, a part of a hospital that focuses on this emergency med uh, cardiac care. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And not all hospitals have that. I mean, if you have a heart attack, the, the ambulance is going to take you to a hospital that has a PCI center. That's a very good point, Elizabeth, because it's important that when you have symptoms uh, that is suggestive of heart attack, the key thing to do is to call the EMS because the EMS is equipped to manage uh, problems like this much better than you driving yourself to the hospital. Um, we've often seen that EMS is on the scene. Uh, they are able to administer certain drugs and some people can have very catastrophic events right after the symptoms start. So they can have a cardiac arrest, in which case, if, if you call the EMS, they have the skills and the equipment to, to defibrillate you and bring you back. So it's very important when you're having chest pain, you use all the resources available, call the EMS who are very well equipped to manage these kinds of situation, can introduce early treatment um, and can bring you to the hospital safely rather than driving to the hospital. So it's very important to understand these concepts where there are systems built to care for you in the community and safely transport you to centers that specialize in this. Fantastic. So I want to I want to turn to Dr. Kinshu about that and talking about you know the importance of having a cardiac care center, but. What are the potential heart attack symptoms that we should look for, Dr. Kinshu? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> there are classic symptoms, meaning the ones that are most common, and there are others that are considered atypical or not so common. And there are really differences between the presentation in um, you know, biologic men and women in terms of how we present with uh, uh, symptoms of, of uh, what could be a heart attack. But first, I just want to go back and make a plug for really heart disease and everything, it's really a chain of survival. And, and you know any chain is only as strong as its weakest link. We don't want the patient to be the weakest link, right? So the patient autonomy and decision-making really needs to be in, 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 in accessing primary care, first and foremost. Heart disease takes years to develop um, unless you're born with a congenital problem, right? Um, and, and these years of, of developing cardiac disease that, that then result in an acute event I mean, every year between 60 and 80,000 patients come to my emergency department, not because they were scheduled to come here, but because something in their lives changed dramatically and caused them to come in, an accident, an injury, pain, symptoms, they're, they're sick now. And um, heart disease, unfortunately, is a, is a, is a, and chest pain is a major a provocative or a reason for people coming into the emergency department, both in their 20s and later in life. And uh, when you look at the, 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 um, all the patients who come in, you, you really, you, you really um, want to address whether it's something that's minor and we're able to discharge or it's uh, severe and we have to refer our patient you know, rapidly to our PCI center and, and um, interventional colleagues um, or hospitalize them. 
you know, were there opportunities to address conditions of hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking, uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, sedentary lifestyle earlier? And I tell you, in this day and age, everyone should just have a telemedicine doctor in their pocket and honestly reach out, get a primary doctor. There are even services now that your insurance may pay for, but that will have the laboratory come to you and a phlebotomist will draw your blood. You know, you, you don't feel any different when you have high cholesterol. You don't necessarily feel any different when you have high blood pressure and things like that. And some of these screening tests, whether it's a CRP, an inflammatory marker, or cholesterol levels, HDL, ADL, LDL, can be very prognostic in terms of risk assessment and then possibly medications. But if you don't have a primary, you can get started with telehealth through you know, the, the public health system. Um, New York City Health and Hospitals has a, a telehealth system, easy to use. And uh, you know, if you don't have somebody because it's hard to get you know, whether it's just difficult to get to a primary care doctor, access somebody on the internet, uh, make it happen. Cause you're the first crucial link in the chain of survival. Mm-hmm. So the question is then, when do you come to the emergency room? Well, there's really no wrong time because look, it, 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 we're prepared. And we're in fact, we're, we feel like nothing better than to, than to assess you, evaluate you, and then to, to discover that your condition is something that we can treat and send you home. I mean, that's a great ending to any story. And about 85% of our patients have stories just like that. They come to the emergency room, they're here for a little while, and then we manage to get you home safer and better off. And hopefully with an ongoing plan in place to manage whatever that condition was. But, you know, okay, so question, am I having a heart attack? Well, first, classically, it's chest pain. Okay, the chest is a big area of the body. And the chest pain is classically anterior, meaning in the front. And it, and it feels classically, again, I use the source because it can be variable as pressure. Some have said an elephant sitting on my chest. Well, I don't think anybody's ever survived an elephant sitting on a chest, quite honestly, but a ton of bricks. Uh, there's a, even, a, you know, back classically when the first, you know, when the store, you know, the doctors way back and you know, wrote the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, descriptions of this, they describe something called a Levine sign where, where the fist is over the chest. It hurts for you. It really is right there. <clears throat> not pinpoint, not one little area, let's say, but diffuse, meaning all over the chest. The pain doesn't go away after seconds. If it's a heart attack, it'll typically last up till, you know, we're talking several minutes, five minutes, then to 10, 15, 20. Um, When you have a heart attack, you may also feel that you can't breathe, you're short of breath. Uh, You feel anxious. You may have uh, sweating, what we describe, uh, and, and you may appear visibly pale. These are classic symptoms. The pain can also radiate to your back, like between your shoulder blades. It can radiate to your shoulders, left more than right, but both can be involved. And the pain also interestingly can can radiate to your jaw. Um, All of these are classic symptoms of a heart attack. And all of these, if the pain is not going away rapidly, would necessitate, as Dr. Hecke, you know, um, advised to call 911. The 911 system is built around the chain of survival premise, meaning EMS receives a call, it's screened by an operator that you're calling because of chest pain. A few questions will be asked and they'll dispatch typically an ALS, Advanced Life Support Ambulance to your address. Within minutes, a paramedic team will arrive. And within minutes, they'll do a 12 lead, meaning they'll do an EKG. That's an electrical recording of your heart's um, electrical conduction, which is, very critical to making a diagnosis of a, of a heart attack because the heart is an amazing organ which has its own ability to you know, beat on its own. A lot of this is, is you know, the currents of, of chemicals that, that are like, like electricity. And they, um, you know, it has this, we have an ability through an amazing technology described and developed many, many, many years ago to do a recording of the cardiac activity. And when we see changes from a normal EKG to a one where there's a heart attack, we will see very reproducible changes that physicians are taught to recognize early on. And uh, we can then activate our, our team to respond. So in New York City, paramedics will, will obtain an EKG of the patient. And um, if they identify uh, a, 
a heart attack in progress at that time, they will then transport the patient to the closest PCI center. PCI, percutaneous intervention, is the gold standard for treating acute occlusive events. That means obstructions of the coronary arteries. You know, in the coronary arteries, those are the blood, the arteries that provide oxygen to this vital organ. When they become obstructed, there's a uh, pain because your heart is not getting oxygen. And you're going to feel that. And, after, and if they're deprived of oxygen, the myocardial cells deprived of oxygen long enough, they'll die. And then you'll have permanent damage. Or your heart might then during this acute phase have a, an arrhythmia where the heart doesn't beat regularly, but beats in a very abnormal way. And that can then cause complete cessation of blood flow to the vital organs in your body, your brain, your kidneys, and, and you'll succumb, uh, you know, become unconscious and die. So um, the uh, classic symptoms, 911 call, paramedics will arrive, they'll make an EKG determination, and then very likely take you to a, a, the closest PCI center, which is the mandate. We are now blessed here in South Brooklyn that Coney Island Hospital is a 911 uh, receiving uh, PCI center in that network now of FDNY EMS because time is muscle, time is myocardium, and we can get our patients earlier from your homes, anywhere in the community to definitive care uh, much more rapidly than we could previously. That's, that's, that's very important. So share with us a little bit about those symptoms that are not as... Sure. So uh, other common symptoms that are not as typical are indigestion, epigastric pain, the pain right under your xiphoid, your breastbone, right? Where you're getting a gnawing discomfort. But again, it's something that wouldn't go away right away. It's lasting, it's ongoing, but it can be less dramatic than that chest pain going all the way to your back. Um, and you know, there's reasons for that anatomically with what sort of heart attack, not every heart attack based upon what part of the heart is affected has the same symptoms, okay? But uh, that's another area. If like it's indigestion, it's not like anything you've experienced before. And let's say with that, you're feeling a, a more anxious, short of breath. It could be a heart attack. That's another area where we've, we've seen delays in patients coming in. I thought it was indigestion. Um, you know, we have, uh, it's, it, but you know, it's such a wide array that I would say, you know, look at your own history. If you're, if you're finding that through your activity, you know, going up the stairs to your apartment, uh, taking a couple of blocks to get to the uh, store, whatever. And you're finding you're having to stop, catch your breath. You're, it's, something's hurting you. Those are symptoms that we describe as angina, where a patient has exertional or discomfort because of some exercise. And then there's intolerance. And it's because the heart in, it typically is having problems getting adequate oxygen through it, it issues with you know a, a flow through the coronary arteries. That's not an acute event. That's typically because of years of accumulation of, you know, cholesterol plaques, things like that, and over time. But if you're having symptoms like that, these are things to discuss right away with your primary care doctor. If you have symptoms, and typically these are symptoms that you have them, then you, you stop, you rest, and within five minutes or so, they go away. But these re do require urgent referral, okay? And we wouldn't be remiss either if you said, look, my doctor, I can't make an appointment for a week or two. Let me go to the emergency room. We're happy to see you anything related you know to your health i mean we do a lot of screening of patients and then if you don't have a primary we'll get you plugged in you know we're again the, my in this day and age with everything we have available to treat hearts acutely and chronically you know no one should, should come to a heart attack and are there usually warning signs somewhere along that history that patient yes um, are people generally resistant to come into an emergency room? Well, yes. Why? They're chaotic. They're busy. They're crazy. One thing we can assure you here at Coney Island, we have a physician in our at, right at triage. Triage is that first area that you come into. And uh, a physician will meet you and greet you on average at this hospital within 10 minutes, 10 minutes. That's wow. a pretty quick time. Now, if we know that an ambulance is bringing a patient with a presumed heart attack. I mean, we'll meet you as soon as those doors open, you know. But if you walk in, the average is within 10 minutes, you'll see a physician who will do that initial screening. And that, and that is important because 
you know, you, you, you don't know what's going on. And we want to put the most expert board certified emergency physician in your hand as soon as possible so that we can get those questions answered quickly. And they work together with our nurses and triage and nurses aides and everybody else as part of a comprehensive team so that you won't um, uh, get lost waiting and worrying and feeling that you're not getting the attention that you need. Again, we would much rather assess that your condition is a little bit of not much and get you home. But we're prepared you know, to diagnose the conditions that can be potentially life-changing. Um, you know, you had mentioned that there was a there was symptoms that were different between men and women. Sure, in the sense, and, and Dr. Hedy could also possibly opine on this, um, is that uh, women's symptoms, biologic women, tend to have more subtle symptoms. Now, yet as it may, just maybe the chest pain's not as severe. Um, you know, we know that historically, a lot of variables that women's cardiac conditions have been historically underdiagnosed as compared to men. Okay, now, and I'm not here to answer why. I'm just saying that, that, that everyone needs to, you know, if you're having classic or atypical symptoms and they seem to be anywhere from chin to belly button, you know, these are, these are issues that we'd like to see you so we can screen you. And if you're having symptoms you know, from chin to belly button that relate to exertion and seem to be coming on when you try to do something uh, that requires some level of exertion, then, hey, that's important enough to be seen urgently. I mean, Dr. Heck, did you have anything in terms of the uh, biologic men and women um, issues? I second your comment. Uh, it, it is very important for the public to know that there are women at risk uh, for these events. Um, and their symptoms tends to be um, either milder or maybe uh, people downplay them. And the, the, the concern is on both sides, downplayed by the patient, downplayed by the providers. So there is more awareness among the providers that there is an underestimation of risk in women and that when women come with symptoms, even when they're mild and atypical, that you can then further assess their risk, look at the risk profile, and even do a risk assessment like a stress test in a hospital and see what it is. And all of these can be done within a day uh, of, uh, of your presentation. For some people where the risk profile is low, you could go home and come for an outpatient stress test. But accessing care would be the most important thing uh, when you have these symptoms that are not usual to you and uh, feels like uh, indigestion where in, in effect could be an event. Now, like Mark said, if there is nothing, then that's the greatest news. You can uh, go home, you will have an initial assessment of your risk profile, you can then get plugged into, into the system, and then you can subsequently follow that uh, care and go forward from there. If there is something going on, even with mild symptoms, then that's the time you need us more than ever, where we can emergently um, assess you, treat you, and take actions to preserve the myocardium. So it, it's important to access care and important to be cognizant about these mild variants of symptoms, not to alarm everyone, but it is something that we often find that uh, patients will say is, oh, it was just mild indigestion when in a sense it was an MI. So uh, important to be educated about that. I think it's a very important point that you're both making because I think as a patient, sometimes we feel, oh, I don't know if it's really a heart attack. I don't want to waste anyone's time. I don't want to get there. And they just tell me I'm out of shape or something. But I think what you're saying, both of you are saying is, don't you make that decision. Go to the well, ER, go to the, go to a PCI center, like at Coney, Hot, Coney Island and, and be able to be assessed and that the doctors will be happy if it's not something serious, they're not going to be mad. They're not going to be frustrated. Um, I think that's a really important message. So I think sometimes people feel, well, it's not that serious. So, you know, you were saying also another really great point, Dr. Kinshu, is um, about what it's like when you actually do arrive to Coney Island sure. Hospital. 
Um, and you were saying that people are seen in 10 minutes. I mean, that's extraordinary to me because I think, you know, people think of the ER and the only thing I ever think of is, you know, hours and hours, but, be, but with this focus on cardiac care, which is unusual, you have 24 seven doctors, cardiac doctors who will see you, you know, within 20, 10 minutes. That's pretty extraordinary. It is. And I can tell you that in, in nation nationally, um, only 10% of hospitals of our size have uh, that, uh, um, have reached that uh, level of uh, effectiveness. So again, it's, uh, we're in the top 10% of hospitals of, you know, 60,000 to 80,000 patient volume. Uh, and we've done that because we know that it's that important. If we are going to um, serve as a, a you know, a, a critical um, life-saving hospital for our community, we can't allow minutes to pass by before we understand what that presentation is all about. And patients with acute myocardial infarctions or heart attacks, time, they walk in, they come in on their own, they come in, yes, by ambulance, sometimes with the um, diagnosis made, and uh, more so now that we are receiving um, ambulances as a part of this uh, FDNY PCI network. But the, to have a physician um, in triage as a first point of contact is a best practice. Mm. It's not done nationally. It's not done in every hospital, uh, but it's done in this one because uh, we have a high incidence of a vascular disease in this community in South Brooklyn. And they manifest as strokes and as heart attacks in both conditions, in both conditions, every minute, every minute counts. And, uh, you know, the difference of, you know, 10 minutes versus 30 minutes can make all the difference to you. Talk to us about that. Tell us, you know, what is the importance of early detection? Sure, sure. The importance is that is that once myocardial cells die, you know, they don't, th th there can be a degree of healing, but very often the, the patient becomes disabled. A terminology, it's an old term, and I don't want it to be misinterpreted. Cardiac cripple is a term, or patients develop heart failure. And heart failure is a chronic condition. There are medications and treatment, but, but once you have an acute event and then your heart and your myocardium, the muscle is no longer able to um, pump blood as effectively as it could prior to that event, you're going to need support throughout your life to um, manage that uh, disability. And, um, you know, it can reach the point of what we call stage four heart failure, where a person is very often almost bed bound. Um, and it's a very difficult life. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to see this happen to a young person. Um, you know, we all, thankfully, we want to live as long as we can, right? Healthy. And that's it you know, while you can live, while you can think, talk, create, you know, love, you want to be able to live. And your heart is a muscle that is so important to you. And, um, you know, we are prepared to change things, change the course of events within minutes by removing the occlusion, the clot with these special, I mean, extremely talented cardiologists and amazing tools now that didn't exist a decade ago. We just didn't have them. But uh, early detection, meaning coming in when, you know, I'm a little worried. Well, if you're worried, I'm worried. Mm. Oh, I'll let us worry for you. Just come. We're your, you're our customer. We're here to serve you. We're not like, you know, in our white coats and standing and better say the right thing here. Or I'm going to admonish you. Yeah. Absolutely not. I mean, we're here to serve this community. And again, we, 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 if you come with a complaint, we're going to listen. Uh, we're going to see you quickly. We're going to determine if it's serious or less so, and we're going to get you in the right hands. Um, uh, but time is everything. Time is everything because we can't re, we can't, once the cells die, we, we can't, they, they don't regenerate. I mean, I don't know, uh, are, are there, is there more discovery in terms of what myocardial cells do? I mean, I know it's not as impact, they're not as impacted as, let's say, you know, neurons, which are, you know, that's it. But um, anything there in terms of regenerating after after MIs? There are efforts being made to try to regenerate the myocardial uh, muscle. 
but those efforts have not led to meaningful clinical outcomes. So uh, while there are, there's a lot of research going on in these patients, it, it hasn't come into fruition about what treatment options we can now offer a patient. So maybe in the future, but now we don't have. Hence, the importance of time as muscle. Um, yeah. Since we don't have alternative options once the muscle is dead, we want to preserve as much muscle as possible and as soon as possible. Right. So time is of the essence. I mean, if you if, if everyone didn't hear that loud and clear, you know, of how much doctors care and how much they want you to get the care that you need immediately and how much time is of the essence. I mean, I think that that is something critical to take home from this webinar is, is that fact and, and the fact that you know, you can have having a center that has 24 seven cardiac care obviously makes a huge difference when you're talking about time. And I'll say also, you know, healthcare can be daunting. First, you have that sense that it's not going to happen to me. Listen, it'll happen to all of us. All of us will have events that we don't anticipate that affect our health. Um, and then the question is, what's around you? Where do you go? And if you don't have an access point, the emergency room is a perfect one. You know, we're a department. We're plugged into everyone, primary care providers, clinics, specialists. And so if you have an issue, you know, then and you don't know where to go, come to us. We'll work it out for you. It's, you know, you can say, well, is that cost effective? Is it, um, is it, uh, is it a uh, effective use of time? Well, you know, it's uh, too much of what we, we pay for in life are things that we ignore over time. And I can assure you that this emergency department is a, um, a compassionate place, is a, a place that will listen to you, and is a place where you can get started if you are at the point where you feel there's an issue, a problem, and you don't know where to go. We can, we can, we can help you and, and, uh, and get things started for you. And sometimes that's all you need so that you can then take the next step and the next step and, and you know, Ma manage your health. Yeah, very good point. So I understand something exciting is happening in the summer of 2022. Can you can you share with me about that? Sure. So many in the community have seen this beautiful um, uh, glass and uh, you know shiny building going up here um, at Ocean Parkway and Avenue Z. And what that is is a, a brand new a critical services building which will include a new uh, cardiac uh, um, catheterization angiography suites and uh, ICUs. And in addition, we'll have a new emergency department, um, which will be, I'll use the term state of the art. It's the newest emergency uh, department uh, in New York City. This is the uh, largest, um, one of the largest uh, healthcare uh, facility investments in the United States up to this point, almost a uh, billion dollars was invested, 960 million, I think. Um, but important to access, to your access for care is that we have a new emergency department, a uh, much larger space, uh, and um, you know, we'll have um, all of the uh, tools that you need you know, to be uh, attended to you know, quickly and expertly. So we're very, very, we're very blessed. I mean, South Brooklyn, this will change healthcare in South Brooklyn because it really is a, uh, um, a vital um, uh, uh, facility and especially those specialty care units like uh, for, for cardiac uh, care are, are new and uh, with um, new equipment we have, and of course the, the emergency department. So, and new operating rooms. So. Um, if those of you have experienced this hospital in the past, um, hospitalized, you'll find also brand new medical surgical beds, private uh, rooms, really everything that you may, it, it's just me unbelievable. And, you know, there's no reason why I don't think we'll be offering uh, tours and things like that to the community you know, after we open. Um, you know, I'm sure you can access uh, things like that to see uh, what it's about. It's nice to know if you have to have a cardiac issue that it can be in such a spectacular facility and also yeah. knowing, knowing peace of mind and peace of heart that um, it is, you know, the most uh, technologically advanced um, 
place you can go. So I think that's a really, really important thing. Congratulations. That's going to be an exciting. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. I, we, I mean, many, many investments, you know, in healthcare, they're in that, uh, you know, 20 million, $40 million area, maybe 200 million max. I mean, this is almost a billion dollars invested in South Brooklyn. I mean, yeah. it's, it's almost, it's sort of beyond comprehension, that's you know, incredible. but it's, uh, it's there, it'll be open. The emergency department should open in June of, uh, uh, 20, um, 21, 22, so, I mean, 22 excuse me. Yep. Very exciting. Very exciting. Yes. I thank you so much for all this information. I do want to get to some questions. We have some great questions here from the attendees. So let me get to those. Um, Elizabeth, another Elizabeth, she wants to know what is more, who's more likely to have heart disease, male, female, black, white. Do you see a distinction? Great question. Uh, and Part of the risk profile in the past did not include different risk uh, ethnicities or races to figure out what the risks are. And I think we are at a point with the American College of Cardiologists um, risk calculator where you can get a better assessment of your risk when you plug your information into that risk calculator. Now, it doesn't mean just because your risk is elevated, you're going to have an event. Um, so it's important to recognize that fact that, yes, your risk is high. That doesn't mean you will have the event, but your risk of having the event is higher. So you want to take the action to lower that risk, to bring down that risk. So the, uh, as opposed to who gets more, you know, we see a breadth of people. We see people from all races. Um, and, you know, we feel uh, the risk is in every one of us. Uh, and the question is, what lifestyle changes can we make as we grow older uh, to lower that risk? And that's the key point. Uh, we don't have a magic bullet to say who is going to get the event. All we can say is, let's reduce your risk. Let's help put you on a path of lower risk, healthier lifestyle. And that's, that's what we can do. And that has significant impact on lowering given rates uh, throughout different populations, throughout different races, throughout, different, uh, throughout the genders. So it's important to recognize that fact and say, okay, risk is elevated, let's lower the risk. We're all susceptible, but we need, so we need to take control and make sure we know what our risk factors are and are talking to our doctors about what we can do to lower that risk. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we have another question um, from M, and this is a very uh, technical question. So forgive me if I mispronounce something, but what percentage of patients present with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and what outcomes? So Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is a rare variant of cardiomyopathy where the heart becomes weak. And it's generally assumed it gets weak seconded to a stressful condition. But what's important to recognize is it is a diagnosis of an exclusion in the sense that if you come with chest pain and we find your heart is weak, we will make sure you don't have any blockages in the heart supplying the heart, and that's not the reason for your heart being weak. So once we have that out of the way, then we can say, okay, maybe this is a stress-induced cardiomyopathy, and then we can go about treating you with medications. And some people, and I would say about 50% of the people do recover their uh, uh, heart function completely. Um, so the, the response to treatment is very good and people do very well. It's, it's not a common condition. It's um, uncommon, uh, but it's not rare that we don't see it. We do see it and in general, our experience has been that a uh, majority of the people do very well within the month. Uh, some take a little longer, but majority do very well. That's great to know. Thank you so much. Um, Marge wanted to know, what if I'm sitting calmly and I feel a twinge in my chest? This only seems to happen when I'm sedit sedentary and sitting. How should I deal with this? Now, this is- Start <laughs> running more often, Marge. <laughs> No, that's not that's not in a doctor opinion. <laughs> so this is a, this is a great example where you should um, uh, see a primary care doctor or a 
um, family practice medicine doctor to understand what your risk is. Now, if this happens often enough that you're concerned, there's no harm in coming to the ER, getting yourself checked. Um, the, these symptoms can be quickly assessed, uh, quickly evaluated, quickly risk stratified, and you could go home you know, within half a day. And you can access this care differently. You can access this if you don't have any primary care, you can get an appointment and you're starting to get this symptoms, you can come to the ER, get quickly assessed, have a peace of mind, half a day you'll be done with this, uh, figuring this out, and then you will be plugged into a system which will be easier rather than for you to figure it out. So we can help you, direct you where to go, what to do next. So uh, you have options to do it. You, you yeah, it's great. Act. It's a good point and drives home what you've been talking about. You know, Marge, if you feel a concern, go get it checked out. Don't wait. And, you know, if you're in South Brooklyn, head over to a New York City Health Hospital's Coney Island because you're going to get the best cardiac care 24-7. But what you were saying again and again should be repeated. Do not sit back and wait. Time no, is of no. the end. Go and get checked. And if you don't have access to a primary care doctor and it's, and it's bothering you, it's recurring, the ED is happy to assess you and evaluate you. Yes, it can take up to several hours if we're doing a comprehensive evaluation in regards to um, assessing certain blood values every uh, you know, four to six hours. However, if we're doing initial screening, initial EKG, initial first set of blood tests, the history, the risk assessment, all that, you know, we have that typically completed in about two hours. So that should be, so if you say, look, I want, I can't get into a PMD. I want to get this figured out. I don't have, I don't want to be staying overnight, but likely we wouldn't. If you're a low risk patient, um, we will typically get this answers for you within a couple hours and then uh, set you on your way with some sort of follow-up. Um, but um, because we can do, you know, the risk assessments and work out, you know, for you, I mean, it, 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 we can supplant, you know, the role of the primary care doctor when, when you don't have that access built in. And, um, you know, I just know that it's complicated for people. It's not easy. And, um, and we're open to um, taking in anyone, you know, with a, a complaint. If it worries you, we'll see you. Uh, and we have different levels where, and don't, you know, we have areas where patients come in where it's an immediate life threat and you're may, managed in a certain part of the ED, you know, and when your condition is, more of a minor type, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll manage that in another part of the emergency department. So you, you may not even be aware of the other work that we're doing, but we'll, we, we will re really, uh, we're dedicated, you know, to the health and welfare of this community. And, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, and we know that if you ignore something that's recurring over and over, and it's uh, somehow related to that central core of your body, that it could be cardiac. And, and we're very, very uh, happy to see you. Thank you for that. And I think that's a great, a great way to wrap up today. I really wanna thank both of you, Dr. Kinshu, Dr. Hede. Thank you so much for all this critical information. I think you know the takeaway certainly is that make sure you know where you are, see your doctor, have your conversations. And if you feel anything, go to the ER, don't wait. You know, understand that New York City Health and Hospitals Coney Island has a premier PCI center that can help you 24 seven. So you don't have to worry about time being of the essence. You just get there and they will care for you. So I thank you both so much for being so generous with your time and your information. I wanna thank our attendees for joining us this morning. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got lots of great information. I did share in the chat information about how to get in touch with New York City Health and Hospitals Coney Island. I also provided the link to the risk uh, estimator and I will provide that also in an email that you'll get tomorrow. So you'll be able to uh, access that there. We also, as I said, we recorded this. You'll get a link to the recording so you can watch it again. You could share it with your community. Please do, we wanna save lives and we want you to have a healthy, beautiful life. Elizabeth, could you share also with the community the um, the link to our uh, New York City Health and Hospitals telehealth? Absolutely. What is that link? Go ahead. I don't have. I don't. I don't. I don't have it to give you. But if you can get that, 
that would be, uh, I think, helpful to the community. 100%. I would love that because this way, if anyone doesn't have a doctor to turn to or wants to get in touch with someone via telehealth, you can do that immediately. So I'll get that email. Excuse me, I'll get that website for everybody. I'll include that in the email as well. And uh, we, 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 we want to get you on the road to, to a healthy, long, beautiful That's right. Life. So thank you all for joining us. I wish you all to stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.